Greetings, humans. Welcome to the Tech Fugitives Show. I'm Mark Tierney, and I'm joined as always, well, not always, but today by Jimmy Ryan. That's right. Jimmy, thanks for being here with us today, man. Oh, thanks for having me. It's going to be a good show. Today's episode is brought to you by ONUG, the Open Network Users Group, where IT leaders come together in a highly collaborative conference, driving architectures and standards as a community. ONUG influences the product development and many technologies like software-defined networking, hybrid, multi-cloud, and cybersecurity. There's a special focus on AI and support of automated software-driven infrastructure like intent-based networking, all of which are topics at ONUG Spring 2019 Agenda, May 7th and 8th in Dallas, Texas. Rapid change demands involvement, so make ONUG part of your digital transformation strategy. Sign up today at ONUG.net. All right, I don't get all TMZ on you or anything, Jimmy, but um, Facebook, it, the pylon with Facebook just keeps coming. I don't know if you saw this, but... Um, CNBC.com tech is reporting that uh, they're delivering ads based on render uh, gender and race stereotypes. I, I just don't feel like they can ever get out from underneath the, the onslaught. Did you see any of this? Did you lose? Did I lose you, Jimmy? No, I'm sorry. Oh, you're killing me, man. <laughs> this is how it's going to go today. No, I did see it though. Uh, yeah, it does seem like it's it's going to be never ending for those guys. The study says there's a significant skew in delivery along gender and racial lines for ads for employment and housing opportunities, despite advertisers setting neutral target parameters. So uh, it goes on to say though that. The, the discrepancies are triggered by how much advertisers are are wanting to spend. So it's kicking in some kind of logic like, hey, if I'm, you know, if I got this much, then maybe I'm going to start, you know, trimming who, uh, who sees what av- uh, advertisements. And they're particularly pointing out, well, maybe I'm not showing enough, you know, the right kind of jobs to the right kind of people, right? Mm-hmm. And it's just not good. These guys have got to get it figured out. Uh, they've got to get their data straight. And that's a perfect segue, quite frankly, into talking about, you know, how you use data the right way. We've got we've got somebody from Trend Data in to speak with us today. I'm really excited about this interview. Trend Data is a provider of cloud-based software, AI-driven people analytics, and we've got the CEO and co-founder of Trend Data in with us, Tom McEwen. Tom, welcome to the show today. Oh, pleasure to be here. Let's start with, by the way, I want to be very clear about <clears throat> anything that has to do with HR. The way I like to refer to this is keep your friends close and your enemies <laughs> closer, right? So anything that has to do with HR would tend to make me a little nervous. I was that, I was that guy that, you know, maybe, you know always on the line like uh you know maybe I, I say the right things but yeah. you know maybe i'm on the line but that's not what your company's all about your company's about really enabling hr departments i think um i'm looking forward to you telling me more about it but let's start let's start with a general term what is people analytics can can we start there is that a fair place to start yeah certainly it's it's kind of an evolved term over the year you know basically what analytics is is taking metrics or data points and you trend them over time Pr- pretty uh common practice in uh business sales stocks stuff stuff like that uh but it like every every technology it seems to have taken a long time to get into hr uh, so HR has got a lot of metrics that they track on their employees, turnover rate, performance, recruiting, and then being able to trend those, you get to see patterns as to why people are leaving, why people are coming to work for you, what certain things induce people to perform more. Um, and when you introduce AI into it, it lets you do a little bit more modeling. So if turnover is going in the wrong direction, um, based on your data and the state of the market, what are the things that are going to uh, keep people here. Do you pay them more, let them work more from home, give them more development? So kind of a broad topic, but it's all about making the people more productive. So y- you you can't have any discussion about um, AI and AI enablement or machine learning without talking about the data. W- one of the things I wanted to, at least I hope we can get into is what are these data sources? What are the what are the interesting, relevant data sources that matter when we talk about people analytics? Well, first of all, it's all the internal data. Um, in uh, 
typical HR department uh, in a company maybe over 5,000 employees, they're liable to have 10 to 15 different data sources. The primary one is an HRIS, uh, like a big PeopleSoft, SAP, Ultimate Software, which probably houses most of your demographic data. But then you bring in other data sources from like talent management. That's your recruiting system, your performance management, your learning. And then piled on top of those, you might have um, uh, learning libraries, background assessment checks. Um, you know, so you, you, before you know it, you've got a bunch of data sources you want to bring, just internal data sources. And then uh, once the um, client has a, a handle on that, they want to see um, how is their stuff comparing to what's going on in the outside world. Then they start bringing in outside data sources, salary surveys to see if they're paying their people competitive, um, bureau labor statistics, turnover. You know, if I'm my turnover rate's 11 and the industry is 17, maybe I'm doing pretty good. Things like that. Right, so it's right, a right. big whole uh, coming together aggregation of data. So uh, you mentioned salaries and salary yeah. surveys. I think at you know at a 10,000 foot view mm. people mistakenly believe that you know salary is the most important thing. Mm-hmm. Obviously it's a you know it's a conversation starter. My experience is at the end of the day it, it it's it's not, right? It's not salary's not the most important thing that there's a lot of things like employee satisfaction. Mm-hmm. Um it, it, how does that play into your uh, in your tool, or does it? Uh, oh, it does, definitely. So um, often what you find that um, salary can be more important at different stages in your career. Right. So if you're young and you might not be getting paid as much as you are, you want, but you see that the company is going to train you to be a manager, introduce you to things that are going to improve your career, maybe um, let you travel more, that might be more important to someone who's maybe five years from retirement, doesn't really care about climbing the next rung, but they got three kids in college. You know, that might be something a little bit more. I want to get paid, at least what the industry is getting paid. And then the high performers often in industry are like they are in professional sports. It's like, I want to be one of the top five paid people at my position, regardless right. of what the, so if they find out they're not being paid regularly, they just might leave out of spite. So there's a lot of different spins on that. Yeah. And I could see where, uh, depending on the, you know, the type of company you are, not all companies are the same. I mean, mm-hmm. I can see where some startups, uh, for example, might might want that aggressive type person in there. Uh, on the other hand, if you're, you know, you're trying to scale and you've got, uh, you know, large organization, mm-hmm. um, you know, maybe you need more team players, if that's the right word. And, uh, and different positions. Yeah. Right. I always like to make the comparison of, um, if you're coaching sports teams, you've got a baseball team where everybody has to integrate and play together. Whereas you're coaching, say, a track or a cross country team, you just want everybody to do their best, and you know it doesn't right, matter. Right, no matter what. Yeah. Are you are you are you finding that HR departments, organizations inside large organizations, are they getting this? Is uh, uh, we, you know we talk we talk um, tech sales with yeah. uh, you know a lot of a lot of folks and they, they tell us, gosh, we, you know, we got hills to climb to sell Mm -hmm. this, this concept, this theory, this new tech, this, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Um, do people get this? Uh, you know, where's the chat, where do the challenges lie and get getting people to understand that people analytics is, uh, is mission critical to success. Well, the problem is getting HR out of the defensive mode to a point where they want to, um, or where they're able to contribute to the business. Most of the time you're selling HR, they're trying to cover their butt. You know, it's like, well, if this happened, it wasn't our fault, or uh, we didn't know about that, that's what happened. And what you're you're always trying to do is give them tools that'll get them a seat at the seat table. It's like, no, if you manage your people right, they perform more, the company makes more money, uh, you don't have to do as much recruiting, you're saving more. Uh, So getting them more out of the, um, you know, I just don't want to get caught unaware to, uh, what can I do to help the business? Is uh, is 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 is, uh, is it continues to be an, a tough sell in the HR world. Yeah, I love that idea that you know perhaps they they shouldn't be compartmentalized. I mean, how do they stand alongside the business, enable the business, and give them the tools for you know for the business to be successful mm-hmm. rather than to be this this standalone thing mm-hmm. that you know may screw up? Is that what you're you know almost implying that they're worried about that a little bit? Well, uh, like any business, you know, remember the old phrase, you never got fired for buying IBM. Right. Uh, it's, things like that are yep. uh, never more true in the HR department. For them to take a risk on a startup, a new technology, it really has to be compelling and show an immediate ROI. Uh, but uh, over the past uh, decade, you've seen the rise of um, 
uh, the CHRO, the Chief Human Resource Officer. And companies have gotten a lot um, more aware at putting business people in that position and not necessarily career HR people in there. And they're bringing a new mindset to HR where it's, uh, we're here to help the business. You know, we're not just here to, you know, hold down the fort. I think if I've had a, a complaint about um, HR mentality is, uh, and by the way, I have tons of friends in that space. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, but it, it, it has always seemed like a, a race, a race to the middle. Like how do we be like everyone else? And by achieving parity, we, we deliver the best, uh, the best H- HR solutions that we can have because we're, we're competitive, we're competitive or the same. As a technologist, that never rang true with me. Like that never felt right to me. I yeah. always felt like, how, you know, how's an organization you're going to differentiate yourself from from others? How do you have, you know, unique um, unique offerings for your for your company, for your firm, for your department that would set you apart? I'm I'm opining here now, yeah, so sure. uh, forgive me, but um, you know, it, it seems like it seems like the tools that that you've got could really put. HR departments in that kind of role, mm-hmm. I would think. Um, yeah, no, it's, um, uh, well, just uh, speaking industry-wise, software mm-hmm. in general, you know, you always have the big players who, uh, you know, say they can do everything, but they're not very nimble, so you can't really, they don't really innovate, develop, and then you have the, the smaller up-and-coming startups who come out with a new technology um, that brings things forward. And then the larger companies think, well, why do we build it? We might as well just buy these guys. Uh, But you have to hit some sort of a mid-ground stride before, you know, departments, particularly HR, as I say, are the more conservative, say, like, uh, that's something we can really use, make use of, um, and we're willing to, you know, go out on a limb and and try that. But, again, it gets back to coming down from the top. Uh, Companies that have really progressive, business-minded CHROs that tends to infiltrate down the organization and they tend to take more chances rather than uh, just, uh, um, you know, trying not to hurt themselves. So, so as, as people analytics hit the, the knee of the curve, would you consider like a hot tech now that you think uh, people generally, HR groups and CHR, CHROs that they're getting it and that it's, it's hot. It's definitely hot right now because you're starting to see people being put into HR, uh, organizations with that topic, with that title rather. So you have a director of people analytics, you have people analytics analysts. Sometimes they're called workforce analytics or HR analytics analysts, but basically they're in to develop that particular practice. Um, so, um, yeah, it's always an indicator that, you know, the, the companies are starting to uh, take that seriously and most of them being put in by CHROs and almost kind of put a little separate from your t- typical HR person who's, you know, out talking to the employees, making sure they're happy. You know, those people are trying to develop the science to build a better workforce. All right. So we've been f- kind of flying 10,000 foot. Let, let's, let's get down to, uh, let's get down to 2000 feet a little bit. Let's, okay. let's hear a little bit about your product. Okay. Um, I, I'm an infrastructure guy. So at some point I'm going to want to talk a little bit about, you know, what the deployment looks like, but mm-hmm. But tell me, tell me a little bit about trend data and, okay. and uh, just the, the functionality. Let's get a little more detailed on the product. Okay. Well, we tried to build, um, I, I've been in the HR space probably about 20 years, um, and ERP space probably another 10 or 15 before that. And uh, what always um, bothered me is anytime you do an implementation with one of these systems, you know, the client will get a demonstration. Um, they buy off on it. It takes nine months to a year to implement and then the client is so happy to get 15% of the features that they originally got demonstrated that the, the, the product itself never really fulfills its promise. So one thing we got in is we wanted to build something that people could start using right away, but still had all the robustness and can be built out and scaled to whatever uh, the client wants. So um, basically we, we talked about, you know, you bring in all the various data sources together to get a holistic approach. Um, But the HRAS system generally has 70% of the data. So we set up a way where you can just pull a report out of your HRAS system and start building analytics, metrics, and even predictive analytics on day one. Then you build out all your integrations moving forward, and the system just continually evolves and gets better. Um, But you can start using it on day one with most of the feature set. And so clients uh, get an immediate ROI rather than having to you know, just wait for a couple hundred thousand dollars later and, you know, hope that they do. All right. Let me push you a little bit. So you say, you know, the customer can start doing this. What, what, what type of resource 
do, the, do those customers need to have or be to, to take advantage of it? And we, we're talking about software developers that can use this or no, if I'm, uh, if I'm a BA or business analytics kind of person, I'm going to be able to use your product without any, uh, any difficulty. If you're a part, if you're a person with an average uh, intelligence and know how to work any kind of, if you've ever worked any kind of data source. Why do I feel like you're judging me right now? See, <laughs> Typical. All right. Keep like going. You always target towards the middle. So right, right, right. there's three of us in the room. So we're just. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. Right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, basically, you can navigate the system. It's very intuitive. And really what we brought into play is we use a lot of natural language uh, processing. We NLP is another hot buzzword in the industry. So rather than having to navigate, drill down on this, make a move on that, you can type in, how do I retain my top performers? And it'll bring up the right analytic for you. Or you can say, um, why am I losing most of my people? And it'll bring up the salary surveys or whatever the particular... Um, reason is. So you can actually do a lot just by knowing how to Google or type in commands to bring things out. Uh, so you don't really have to be um, a, uh, a, a data scientist to use this, but I always say it's, it can be as robust as the user wants it to be. So if you want to just bring it in, get basic people, workforce in, uh, information, uh, you just really know how to operate a computer. If you want to dig in with the science and give out all the predictive stuff uh, that um, you know really will set your uh, company apart, that's there too. That's nice. So uh, you must have some power users out there. Yeah. Anything that they've done that, um, I used to work for a company and that uh, large financial uh, firm and we used to get a reputation of, well, you, these people, they, they took our product where we didn't realize it was even going to go. Like they, yeah. they stretched the limits of, uh, uh, you know, the, the capabilities in a good way. Yeah. Right. Now, sometimes those things cause problems too, but have you had some power users that like surprised you? Like, wow, I, you know, you, you really squeezed, uh, uh, every ounce out of that thing. Uh, probably not to, uh, we'll probably have some that are maybe 70 to 75% right. of the capacity. What really always amazes me is just the little insights that uh, clients get out of it. You know, we have, we, we had a bank that had uh, you know, very high turnover at their branch level. And, you know, they're trying to say, well, are we not giving them enough uh, money? Are we not, um, having enough happy hours? What are we not right, doing? Right. And they just did a simple analysis that said, basically, if, uh, you hire someone at a branch that's more than 15 miles away, it's three times more likely they're going to turn over after six months. Oh yeah. And it's like, uh, well, that makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, we talk obviously about AI, but we also talk about machine learning. Mm -hmm. are, are those, let's talk about how they're used uh, and are they used properly in, in context of, of trend data? What, what's the, you know, what's the implementation of those two in, uh, in well, I've got product? a good, I've got a good joke for that one. All right. All right. Basically, machine I'll tell you what, you tell the joke and I'll decide if it's okay. good. No, sorry, no pressure. Keep going. Well, basically we say that machine learning is written in R or Python and AI is written in PowerPoint. All right. <laughs> okay. I'm going to, uh, so. You're going to reserve judgment. I, I'm going to reserve judgment because I really care about you as a person. <laughs> um, you're a nerd. I love it. Um, I mean that in a good yeah. way. All right. So, uh, but, but let, let, let's, let's peel that apart. Yeah, sure. What are the machine learning uh, aspects of your system? Do you have some today? Yes, very, okay. very much. So, uh, if you get down to the very basic level of you know what software was designed to do, it was designed to just automate a manual process. So you take something like recruiting, you know you had five people, someone interview it, pass it on to someone else, pass it on to someone else. Eventually, somebody likes or doesn't like someone, and uh, you'd build a recruiting software package to actually track that. Um, but if someone constantly, if, ever, if uh, developers say from uh, uh, San Francisco, keep dropping out on the fourth interviewer um, for whatever reason. You'll never know necessarily that until some geek runs a spreadsheet and says, hey, by the way, this happens. Um, you know, you might be able to do it on a dashboard and show it a little quicker, but it's, an, it's a loop that just keeps running until yeah. someone notices. Right, right. At a very basic level, what machine learning does is says, well, there's something wrong here, and it'll correct it. Maybe it won't send it to that person. Maybe they're taking an assessment test late in the process, and it'll actually correct the process before um, anybody has to notice it. All right. Hmm. Nice. Um, let's talk a little bit. I want to go now down an, another hmm. level. Yeah. So let's talk about the implementation of the yeah. of the product. Yeah. Um, it's cloud-based? Is it cloud-based, yes. Only cloud-based? It's only cloud-based. All right. Yes, yeah. 
And um, like, have you you have one one provider? Does it matter? They they can deploy it into any cloud they want, or is it software as a service? It's software as a service. Okay. We use Amazon Cloud, so it's basically a, um, that's how they do it. They can have as many users, they can have as many instances as they want, but it's all in the cloud. Yes. And generally, we um, the people who use our software, I talked about HR, uh, generally starts in HR, uh, where people in HR will basically be looking at the whole organization. So, you know, I'm a VP of HR. I want to look at what's the turnover. I want to be able to drill down by um, maybe division, by manager, by location. Think Same thing for recruiting, you know, where are people coming from? Um, where are my best people coming from? And generally at that level, you know, you've got like a HR is looking at everything, maybe a C-level person be looking at everything. But the real goal is to break it out of HR to where the individual line managers Absolutely. are looking. Yeah, so I'm looking at it for my 40 people. Um, the company probably doesn't want me to see all my peers, 40 people, or my managers, and it may not even want me to see um, – uh, to see salaries or something like that at sure, that level. Sure, sure. So, so you can create personas around all of that, and uh, depending on your credentials, see what correct. people want you to see, yeah. right? Is that right? Yeah. So the, the deployment, um, again, can be very evolutionary, like we talked about with the data sources. You can start uh, where you want to validate it and where the people are expert, and then they come be your internal champions and then start rolling it out to the rest of the organization. And we price the product that way. We, you can buy it by individual user, but then eventually clients will get to the point where they want an unlimited number of people to have it, and then we price it by employee, and you just and as many users as you want can use it. Are you? Do you have any multinational uh, deployments yet? Uh, uh, yeah, we have a few where they um, they're U.S. based, but they have um, uh, uh, um, uh, satellites around the globe. We do have one company that's based in Lebanon that uses our product. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So is there a sweet spot for uh, the size of the organization that, that uses your product? Oh, well, the, the, the product will scale. Uh, basically, we say over 500 is where you really get the most value. Um, I have a pyramid where I draw out generally is where it's um, 200 to 500. You can use it if you have a lot of employee movement. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of uh, retail organizations down there that you know, are constantly churning people. Right. Uh, 500 to say 5,000 is probably the sweet spot for us because uh, Oracle and SAP don't play down there and they, they tend to want to uh, say they do everything even though they don't. Um, but uh, we, we do a lot down there and down there it's a combination of, uh, you know, they just want to visualize their data and then do some predictive stuff. Um, that's why I say majority of our clients are about, you know, 70 to 75% utilization. Um, so they do a lot of visualization, you know, just being able to see what turnover is, uh, granularize it by different uh, filters, and then build out models uh, as to what they can do to change it. We have a few clients above five and 10,000, and they're almost exclusively interested in the predictive components. You know, they want to know, you know, do their people in the Philippines uh, not um, come, um, aren't happy because it's a long commute, the weather, they bring in all sorts of different factors in addition to the traditional ones of, you know, pay, um, engagement, uh, and um, development, stuff like that. So they bring in a lot of external factors. How flexible is the product? I, I think about my own career mm -hmm. and the, the inflection points uh, yeah. that come up at, that, you know, where, wow, all of a sudden, and sometimes very quickly, mm -hmm. yeah, very quickly, new skill sets become just absolutely necessary, maybe because it's a, a technological change, yeah. right? Um, has your product had to deal with any of that where, you know, suddenly all of a sudden your customers are like, wow, we need to make sure we're, we're tracking particular skill sets in terms mm -hmm. of the employee base. Like, do they understand agile or do they understand, you know, cloud or do they understand whatever yeah. it is? Yeah. Um, it, any examples of that? Like that you've seen that, uh, yeah, absolutely. I was, uh, having a good conversation with John Sumsner, who's a writer for HR executive magazine. And we're talking a little bit about, you know, predictive models and such. And what we do a lot of the times to calibrate our models is we'll take a, a historical snapshot. So an al the AI engine develops an algorithm that says this is what your turnover is going to do based on factors in the next year. Uh, what we'll do is go back and take the data. Because nice thing about HR departments, they have like 10, 20 years worth of data. They're like pack rats. They don't do a lot with it, but it's all sitting there. And once you can do something with it, you know, it's really useful. So we'll go back to like 2016 use the algorithm in 2016 to project what was supposed to happen in 2017 and then compare it. 
But what we often find out is, uh, you know, things are a little different. If I go back and do that in 2009, there's a recession. Uh, so that's maybe not a comparable snapshot to 2015 and 2019. And also, you know, like the av- advent of smartphones and stuff just changed the way, totally the way people worked in the 2000s, like the Internet right. did in 1990. So, yeah, so skill sets are often, and more often uh, companies uh, monitor that in a, in a time-sensitive, you know, so... You know what? Uh, what drove something five years ago is not necessarily what drove it this year. Like I think, uh, as a manager, things that I'd be interested in, uh, especially in a technological firm, are you know maybe tracking. You know, who are my early adopters? Like who yeah. who are my employees that want to adopt and are good at adopting technologies? You know, quickly. Yeah. Um, my partner and I uh, we joke a lot. He he's actually Kyle. He's a lot more um, uh, I'd say innovative mm-hmm. than than I am. But I'm, uh, but I'm a first follower. Like I'm somebody who, I, I may not, I may not uh, necessarily see the innovation uh, b- before it hits. But once mm-hmm. it hits, I'm in. Like you know, so I, I love being that early adopter. Yeah. Um, and it just seems to me that these sorts of things happen all the time, and you know, your ability to measure that, you know, through a tool, and and understand, wow, the, these are the people I need to get involved very quickly in something strikes me your tool could help with that. Yeah, tool can help with that a lot. And particularly, um, you know, a lot of people don't give it as much credence as it should, but social media engagement is actually a very big indicator who early adopters are. Mm. So a lot of companies with corporal, corporate um, social media nets um, generally can track, um, you know, who gets on them and uses them. Are the people tend to personality-wise be the ones who are will take chances, will engage, and will try new stuff out. So that's a that's been one factor we've seen in a lot of our models. Where you're um, pulling that in as a data yeah, feed yeah, too, right? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, okay, tell us. Uh, I had a million questions here. <laughs> I, w- I want to make sure I haven't uh, already hit a bunch uh-huh. of them. But um, value prop bigger. I mean, I assume that the bigger the organization, the bigger the value proposition right. is for this whole thing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, standing it up sounds like, uh, you know, cloud based sounds like it's, uh, it sounds like it's a snap. Uh, but that's not always true. What, what, what gets in the way? What, uh, what can make something, uh, difficult to, to, to put trend data in and stand it up? Any, any blockers that you've, uh, come across that you, you know, wish companies yeah. would, uh, pay more attention to? Well, usually it's it's usually two things. One, getting the and this is true for pretty much any uh, software implementation, getting the client to put together, you know, put forward some champions are going to own it, um, is is a big one. Because mm-hmm. um, really, a lot of what it is is making sure the data that's going into the system is good data, and a lot of times that requires someone on the client end to be able to pull an initial feed and be able to say, okay, this is, this is accurate data. And what's actually good about our system is the visualization component of it. You know, you can pump it in and pretty much see if something's wrong. You know, if uh, you have 5,000 employees and 4,000 of them report to one person, there's probably a field missing or something like that. Or if uh, turnover in, you know, one month is, you know, seven times higher than anything else. Um, so you're able to do a lot of that, but it usually takes uh, someone on the client side to work with you in the beginning to kind of clean up the data. Uh, data is a big, a, a big problem in any ERP implementation, but the good thing about most of what you get in HR and most of what you get in business is it's all structured data. It's coming out of systems or at the very least coming off of spreadsheets, so you're not uh, necessarily pulling a lot of texts or uh, you know, you could pull text, emails, Word documents, which are a little unstructured. But mainly we find most of the stuff we bring in is coming in somewhat of a structured format. So that's good. Uh, the other big blocker is prioritizing of events. Um, like I said, HR uh, com- um, departments tend to have, uh, you know, 15 different systems. And it seems they're always replacing one right at the time you're trying to get going. So, right. so you know, they buy your software, and then it's like, okay, well, let's get together next week. We'll launch the initial upload and get you going. And they're like, yeah, well, we just also bought a new HRIS system. That's going to take 10 months to implement. So uh, uh, let me get back to you. And you're like, no, 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 no. This will be up before that HRIS guy gets to your doorstep. <laughs> right. Yeah, so um, – and that's – I'd say that's, that's probably – Maybe not unique to HR, but IT departments, they, they, they just uh, uh, feel safe when they're inundated, so they inundate themselves. To, right, right. You know. um, all right. 
I love asking this question in ter- when uh, you're talking about any type of data application, yeah. and it, it, it's the security issue. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I'm a chain ownership person, right. and my belief is in uh, some of the early early days of big data, mm-hmm. uh, people are taking advantage of all the cool stuff you could do with big data. Yeah, uh, Big data is a big engine behind AI now, mm-hmm. uh, but I think people lost sight in some cases of the chain ownership of that data. Yeah. Like, you know, who's responsible and, um, you know, did I, you know, did I create a you know, my own little data lake and it became part of a data ocean and, Mm -hmm. you know, access, uh, you know, perhaps got, uh, lost along the way. Like who should, who should have access to that? Um, tell me a little bit about the security around, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, user security around your product. Okay. Well, first off, just talk about cloud-based software, this, uh, movement from, uh, private to public, uh, data center. So, uh, uh, the majority of our uh, company, we came from, a um, uh, an HR, a talent management company called HR Smart, which was based up here in Richardson, had a good 10, 15 year run, and then we sold it to a larger um, software player called Dell Tech. Um, we were one of the first cloud-based uh, HR software solutions back in the early aughts. Um, but we had a private data center. You know, we it was our own space in a building. We maintained the servers. We did everything. Um, uh, after we sold that company and started formulating, take, starting up this new one, the, uh, sort of towards the end of when we were there and the beginning we started here, almost everything went to public clouds like uh, Amazon and Microsoft. Uh, so um, in one respect, that's been very good because they take care of all the security and they have a heck of a lot more to lose than a lot of startups who are working with them. Uh, but secondly, you're you're kind of putting it into someone else's hands as well. Right. Yeah. So um, you know, so there there is that challenge there. So in addition to what a client might give us, uh, we have very stringent uh, security requirements that we make sure that Amazon meets before we uh, you know put a put our stuff up in there. Um, but you know that part of the air being uh, um, secure, um, the application is more dependent on who let who you let see information. Um, and then again, there's um, you know, issues around, uh, you know, you know, can, uh, can managers use information to bully employees? Are you enabling them by giving them all of this insight and stuff? Yeah. So it's a, you know, it's a very, there's a lot of ethical questions there, but as far as what actually uh, is secure, it's totally up to the end user, um, you know, as to uh, who's going to get to see everything, uh, what they're going to get to see, um, you know, making sure that the wrong people aren't going to see what's going on. Um, PII, personally important information. So I could see. So I'm kind of a scenario based yep. guy. So I, I could see where, well, in the in the perfect implementation, I've got uh, you know I've got your analytics platform. You know, perhaps I've got two or three feeds of data. Mm-hmm. Uh, by the way, I'm just postulating here, right? Yeah. Uh, two or three feeds of data that you're come descri- into it. You're describing a very common scenario. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and um, we're all we're all good at the ch- the chain ownership of the mm-hmm. you know this particular data and you and Jimmy are both allowed to see this data. Yeah. Um, The thing that I find can get, you know, trick things up, trip people up is now I brought, now I'm bringing in, I've sort of done my deployment, right? Yeah. And now I bring in this fourth uh, data feed. Mm -hmm. Important. It's relevant. But maybe uh, you're allowed to see it, but Jimmy shouldn't, right? Yeah. I, I'm just worried about the best practices you know, around, you know, maintaining the chain ownership of those external data sources mm-hmm. into your system. Um, do you have, and I'm sorry, I'm putting you on the spot, yeah. but I mean, do you have, like, are there, you know, processes uh, in your system that sort of account for that? Like, uh, you know, how do you, how do you know this data element that now I've introduced mm-hmm. uh, should be visible to somebody else? How does that, how does that work? Well, essentially, uh, the connection needs to be as secure as you want the application to be. Now, there there are there are a lot of um, um, way uh, you know, like we put it in our system too. We you upload legacy files from spreadsheets. Um, you know, those are as secure as whoever handles them. Um, but companies that really want to make sure, like you know, that scenario you drew, where you have a fourth data feed, generally the most secure way is drawing a, an API connection right from the source data, so it doesn't go into a a third party's hands. It goes right from the sy- one system into another system. Um, but yeah, you're. Uh, I've always gotten a kick out of this in um, you know deployments since I've I've been in this business. You know they beat us up on security. You know for ten months of the sales cycle and I say, well we're ready to stand you up. Okay, I'll email you over a spreadsheet. And you're like, 
Mm, right. <laughs> right. That's uh maybe not cutting. It's not going to not going to yeah. carry the day. Yeah. Um okay, I'm not sure though that um let me ask it a different way. Mm -hmm. Do do you have the ability to um another on this put you on the spot mm -hmm. question. Do you have the ability to anonymize data at all? Is that uh, is that a feature that you support? Oh, absolutely. And yeah. and uh what we request from our clients is uh um, if they give us permission, we actually anonymize their data and use it on our own testing um, uh, uh, outside of the client, so we can build up better algorithms. Oh, stuff. nice! Yeah, yeah, that is a that's that's a good feature. That's yeah. an excellent feature. Yeah. Um, all right, what have I missed? What uh, any anything hot, hot that's going on with the company? Oh, what's hot that's going on in the company? Uh, we uh, um, uh, we're doing a couple of shows next year. HR Tech. I don't know if you've ever been. That's the big tech show. It's every fall. Um, so we were in a startup competition last year. We got to the final round, uh, lost to some impressive young lady who used to work for Google who built. Um, um, nice. Yeah. So, but um, um, uh, we are, uh, we do a monthly webinar every month that uh, attacks uh, very different um, topics in HR. We've got one coming up uh, the end. Of, we always do it the last Thursday in the month. And this one coming up is talking particularly about how surveys and assessments can augment um a lot of your uh, system data in um, people analytics. Um, I have a, a, a column in uh, Forbes magazine where I write about people analytics. And I just put out a new article, which really, be, yeah. <laughs> wow, that's been so. Uh, what that's coming out soon, or is it already out? Uh, just went in. It'll probably be out in three weeks, but um, I've got four or five that are on there right now that are cached that can be read on the. All right. Well, you make sure when when that goes out, give me a heads up, and uh, I'll I'll pump it on the show because uh, that'd be great. That'd be that's uh, that's fantastic. We'd like yeah. to hear more about that. Yeah. All right. I'm going to ask you my my uh, uh, buy sell question. I warned you, but in pre show mm -hmm. about uh, we'd like to ask our guests if there's a if there's a tech out there right now that uh, you're interested in doesn't have to have to do any can be but doesn't have to have anything to do with uh, uh, your business, any any tech out there that's hot that you'd like uh, find interesting or fascinating or? Well, I have a, <clears throat> my daughter just started her freshman year at college. And uh, last year as I was um, researching colleges, um, we, you know, we were looking, you know, at the big state schools, Texas, uh, uh, Texas A&M, Texas Tech, Tech, all great schools. Um, uh, we found out about this uh group called Brainsy. I don't know if you've ever heard of Brainsy.com. No. They do expert calling networks. It's basically LinkedIn, but where you can sign up and talk to the expert on the other end. Interesting. Yeah. So we, they had a site with a bunch of college experts on there. And so we signed up, talked to one, uh, booked a half an hour. And uh, they told us, um, you know, the state schools are great. You'd never go wrong with them. If you're looking at some private schools, there's a few, particularly in the connecting area, that are very aggressive with Meridate right now. And one of them was Tulane uh, down in New Orleans, a good right. school. Um, so um, we actually investigated them, compared it up against, uh, you know, the, the state schools there and um, uh, really had a great conversation. We actually went back at a few more co conversations with the expert and the whole thing cost me about $75. But, you know, I got the uh, I got the best school for my daughter. You got the skinny man. That's yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. I'm going to flip it around. And uh, this is always a tough one. You may not have <laughs> any dogs out there uh, that, that don't hunt with you. Any tech that you go, I can't believe people are still using that. Uh, what do, what do, what do, what do I want to do? Well, you know, I, I, I don't want to. I, want, I don't want to. Uh, don't name names if you don't want to. That's no, no. But I'll, I'll, you I, can if you want to. But. It's, it's, it's not a dog. It's, it's what I call a cockroach is, is spreadsheets. It's, uh, right. They are going to be around. You know, when the world explodes, you're going to have a cockroach working on a spreadsheet. They just will not die. No, they won't. <laughs> and and if, for 25 years, I, I've been selling, and half the time, whatever I sell, it's like replacing a spreadsheet. <laughs> well, I, um, so they fall into the category that I, I, you know, say are these personal information systems, right? Yeah. That yeah. Pe people invent for themselves. The guy who invented spreadsheets, if he had any idea, or the person, mm -hmm. they had any idea what they'd actually be used for in the yeah. in the future. I, turn over in their grave, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, it's crazy. All right. Well, today we had on Tom McEwen from Trend Data uh, talking about AI an AI analytics and uh, and his great product. Tom, thanks for being with us on the show oh, today. Oh, it was a real pleasure. This is a perfect example of why Tech Talk doesn't suck. Thanks for joining us, everybody. We'll see you next time. Take care. Yeah. How long did that go?